Honourable Members, good morning. Shall we get started? So welcome to day two of this post-election seminar. Today we've got three sessions, and the first two are going to be done by the Honourable Alex Boyd Knights, the Speaker of the Dominica House of Assembly. Honourable Boyd Knights has been Speaker of the House of Assembly since 2000. She holds a law degree and a certificate of legal education. She's a practicing attorney at law. She specializes in family law, land law, and labor law, and has, been, has become well known as an advocate of women's and children's rights. Speaker Boyd Knights has attended numerous conferences and seminars organized by the CPA, the FIPA, the IPU, UNIFEM, and many others. She has been a member of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Executive Committee and was the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians Chairperson from 2010 to 2013. In 2013, Speaker Boyd Knights was awarded the Dominica's second highest honor, the Cesaro Award for Parliamentary Service. Honorable Speaker Boyd Knights. Thank you, Chair. Good morning to all the members present, um, the clerk and the two clerks present as well. Um, I, um, I have two um, presentations to make. The first one is the role of, uh, that's better. Uh -huh. The role of members of parliament, including the role of the backbencher. Um, what I would have liked it to have said, instead even of the backbencher, not that I, I deem backbenchers unimportant, but the role of women parliamentarians, because more and more it's been recognized that women parliamentarians play a specific role in parliament. But I'm going first to go through, and I'm hoping that this, this session is more interactive than it is me preaching. I'm not good at preaching. I, I like to get feedback so that I can roll along. And so I'm hoping that you will cooperate with me in that regard. Um, I'll, I'll just say a few things first and then stop me at any time. I am amenable to that. Um, first, we ask the question, who is a member of parliament? The obvious answer would be anyone who lawfully sits there. So then the next question would be, who gets to lawfully do so? And it would be, in the case of Dominica, and from time to time I'm going to be referring to two things, the, our constitution and our standing orders. And so in Dominica, the constitution at section 29 and 30 do just that. And if I may be permitted to read, I'm sure that you have similar provisions in your constitution. And uh, in spite of the fact that um, you are in the position of being um, not an independent state, I think a lot of the time um, the, there's a lot of similarity in our standing orders because after all, we take as our model the Westminster model. And so that is where the similarities will be. And so at section 29, it says, there shall be a parliament of Dominica which shall consist of the president and a house of assembly. And section 30 says, the house shall consist of such number of representatives as corresponds with the number of constituencies for the time being established in accordance with the provisions of section 57 of this constitution. Who shall be elected in accordance with the provisions of section 33 of this constitution? Basically, it's just a matter of, well, there's these constituencies, the persons who the chief elections officer deems to have been um, the victors. The chief elections officer will prepare the, lit the writ, send it to parliament, and that will guide us as to who won and who is able to sit. Now, um, interestingly, and, and, and that probably is where Dominica differs from many jurisdictions, but I, I, I do know that St. Vincent and a couple other um, jurisdictions follow this, where we have a unicameral legislature, that is to say, the Senate, as well as the elected members 
sit together. So the nominated and elected sit together in what is known as a unicameral legislature. In our case, we have 21 elected members and nine senators, and the senators are appointed by the president um, on the advice of, five of them on the advice of the, the prime minister, and four on the advice of the leader of the opposition. Now, as I said, so there have been 21 constituencies. There would be 21 members of parliament, the Senate, and of course, our constitution allows for the speaker to come from outside, as well as the attorney general. So there in our um, parliament, our full complement can be up to 32 members, comprising of 21 um, elected, nine nominated, the speaker, and the attorney general. Now, um, we, I don't think we should concern ourselves with the rule of the attorney general. His rule is pretty much prescribed anyway by the constitution. And the attorney general, as I say, can most times comes from outside. Of course, he's not able to vote on certain things, but he is for purposes of the constitution. And I will read for you. At any time when the office of attorney general is a public office, the attorney general shall by virtue of holding or acting in that office, he is, known, he, he is a member of parliament. There's a similar provision for the speaker. So that is why they're considered members of parliament as well. You know, um, for purposes of this discussion, as I say, I will leave out the AG and concentrate on the other members and to a lesser extent the speaker, because I know that um, you've covered pretty much in, in one of the other sessions the role of the speaker. Now, section 41, of course, um, provides, as, and there is a similar provision I know in all constitutions, parliament may make laws for the peace, order, and good government of, as always says, Dominica. And that is the mandate, therefore, of the parliament, but the functions and rules of that mandate is carried out, of course, by the members. Now, the standing orders of the parliament, I consider it the parliamentary Bible, serve as the guidelines to fulfill the rule of the members, or the various rules of the, the various members. And the rights and privileges, which I will speak of in the next session, clothe and at the same time shield members as they perform their parliamentary rules and duties. I'll briefly go through the speaker's rule. The rule of the chair in the house and in committee. In another, as I said, in session four that was covered, but it, it, it behoves me to re reiterate certain um, aspects of the speaker's rule to ensure that the rules are observed by both sides of the house in, while the house sits and in committee. A very important function of the speaker, I don't know how much that was stressed, was the, to vet questions, motions, and amendments, and all these sort of things. And that can be quite contentious at times. As you all probably realize, the speaker's powers are vast. And in Dominica section, standing order 6-5 provides that. The speaker in the house and the chairman in committee shall have power to regulate the conduct of business in all matters not provided for by these standing orders. So not only does the speaker derive powers, um, specific powers under the, the standing orders, there's also a provision which says that the speaker has powers to regulate and conduct the matters even when they are not contained in the standing orders. And even um, standing order 21, standing order, sorry, 23, is the one that deals with um, questions. I don't know what your provisions are like when it comes to questions, but um, the, the, the whole thing is very stringent. Um, but it starts by saying, the right to ask a question shall be subject to the following general rules. 
as to the interpretation of which the speaker shall be the sole judge. I don't know if you have such a similar provision. You don't, in, but Jamaica does, okay. Now, it goes on to say, the proper object of a question is to obtain information or quest of a question of fact within the official responsibility of the minister to whom it is addressed or to ask for official action. Now, um, I know of um, Antigua had a problem like this, and I can speak of the problem that I encountered as speaker over such a question. It was um, alleged by members of the opposition in the general media and so on that the Labour Party government had received funds from this jurisdiction. I will not name the person. <laughs> I will not give the surname, but the name was Susan. <laughs> so if you know. And, that, and then they posed a question in the House concerning that. Um, but I, I, I refused the question on the grounds that if a private entity was dealing with a, a party, a political party, the interaction between the two cannot be considered something that the minister would come by in his official capacity. So when I refused the question, the oppo opposition um, even took me to court over it, and the court ruled not only that they first said that they didn't really have jurisdiction over that because the speaker shall be the sole judge on, on that basis. But they said even, even if they had, they would have to agree with me that in fact that question was not allowable under this particular limb of the um, parameters of the questions. And so there are several other um, restrictions. Questions shall not include the names of persons, and unless they, they, they help to make the, the, the question more intelligible. And a question also ought not to be asked if the answer can be found in public records. For example, a, min, a member asked a question about a certificate of title. And of course, he can go to the register and find that out. And also, and, and one of the things members um, of the opposition tend to forget is that the standing orders are there. Government ministers who are being asked questions have as much access to the provisions of the stand, standing order 21 as the opposition. I'm sort of just, the, the speaker is just the, 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 um, the referee as it will. So now if an opposition member asks a question which is not allowable, and the, it passes, bypasses the speaker for some reason. By the time it gets to the minister who has answers the question, the minister is aware that, that that question is not allowable. You understand? So, it, 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 therefore, the speaker has almost a double duty to ensure that the questions that do reach the minister are, in fact, allowable. And there's been a whole series of issues over that whole business of the speaker of it in questions and motions and amendments and all of this thing. And so... Um, uh, speaker, what if I could ask a question? Yes. One of the problems that we have in this jurisdiction is that after questions are approved by the speaker, the, the government or the day and the ministers just tend to ignore the fact that the question has been submitted, has been approved. And oftentimes, it is not even put on the business paper. Now, our standing orders lays out a format by which the order paper is supposed to yes, follow. All, yes. Now, in the bad old days, when I was here between 1984 and 1992, any questions that were approved by the presiding officer at that time, who was the governor before the speaker came in during that period, had to be placed on the business paper, and they were placed on the order paper on the order of which they were received. That's correct. And the business committee had no authority not to put them on the business paper. They had to be listed, and each standing order also limits three questions per day 
by any person. But whether the sorry, would that be for oral response or written response? Oral response. That's right. Written response is only allowed here if the minister didn't have time to answer it during oh, the session, okay. during mm -hmm. the meeting. Mm -hmm. Then it the questions used to be listed, and if the minister was not ready, the minister had to get up and ask Parliament to please defer the question for another day and give the reasons. What happens now is that the business committee has assumed that it has the authority to not put questions on the order paper until their minister is ready to answer the question. And, and I think that is an abuse of the business committee powers under the standing orders. And I believe that every day the order papers produced, questions by members should be listed on the order paper that have not been answered in the order in which they have been received, and if they are not, the minister is not ready, he should have to get up and endure the embarrassment of saying, I'm not ready to answer the question. For instance, I have questions submitted in June 2009 that haven't yet been answered or put on the order paper. Now, um, our standing orders are slightly different from yours, and our legislative agenda is also different. I presume you meet at a set time every week or so. Oh, oh no, no, or you no, meet that's, when that's not going down that road, ma'am. Because that I'll, I'll be on my soapbox all day. I have no, no. no idea when Parliament is going okay, to meet. Okay, well, well, we are, we are, are sim <laughs> we, are, we, we agree on that. This similar in Dominica, yeah. we the Parliament meets when the government um, advises that they, there's a legislative agenda to be fulfilled, and we prepare the things. However. What the standing orders say in our jurisdiction is that questions have to be in 14 days, any question that comes in 14 days before the meeting, once it has met the criteria of the speaker, must be entered on the order paper. There's no if and once. I'm surprised that you're telling me that the, 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 the speaker has approved a question and it doesn't get on the other people. I think that is wrong. If the standing orders um, don't prevent it, it should automatically go there. Because we have a standing order that actually says, you know, and as a matter of fact, what has happened? Okay, because of the fact that we don't meet regular, regularly, the opposition waits for, to be told that there's going to be a meeting for them to send in their questions. And once the questions have been approved. But the only thing is, we do not always know 17 days before that there's going to be a meeting. We might only get notice that would only allow us the 12 days notice. Because there are several timelines. Well, well. No, well, we have specific um, time frames and guidelines. The, we have, um, the standing orders provide that at least 14, anything to go on the order paper must come in 14 days before the meeting. So, for example, if cabinet decides that they're, I'm going to give you specific dates. Cabinet decides that on the 20th of the month there's going to be a meeting. And they only let us know that on the um, 5th of the month. Well, immediately we can send a notice out to let members know. And then we tell them, giving them that there will only be two days before the 14 days, letting them know that by 4 p.m. on that particular day, questions have to come in. Now, there, the, over the last few months and um, meetings, we've not had the liberty of telling members the meeting is beyond 14 days. And so when that happened in September last year, members the opposition members kicked up a fuss and said, oh, we didn't let them know, we did, so there were no questions. And we, let, we told them that the standing orders provide that as you have a question, you send it in. And all questions that are there 14 days before will go on the order, order paper. And so we told them so, and we wrote them again in December to let them know that. Yet the, the, the member of the opposition took high umbrage and wrote letters all over the world 
to Commonwealth, I'm sure you all got one, saying that the speaker is not allowing their questions. All when in fact, he is the one who is not doing what he's supposed to do. You know? But anyway, be that as it may, whenever we can give them the 14-day notice, we do. If we can't, well, we can't. But then, the other important issue is that once the question come, questions come in, the clerk and I sit and we go through the questions and we let the members know that they must stand by. So like if we tell them, well, they send in a question and um, by midday and then, well, it, the, the time is closing off at 4 p.m. of that day, the members know they should give their phone numbers and stand by their phone. So we tell, we, I call a member and say, look, you can't ask that question because of this, that, and the other reason. Can I change it like that? When I first became speaker, I would change it because the rules allow me to change it. And then one opposition member told me very brusquely, don't tamper with his questions. I said, okay, I won't tamper them. If I can find you, they just don't go on the other paper. So they realize now that, you know, um, I'm just trying to facilitate them when I, I call them and tell them. And so I make whatever changes. But again, there's rules that say that the questions mustn't be too so long. There's some, some uh, members, they want to give a preamble and then ask the question. So, well, if you want to give a preamble, your question can only be one line long. You have to decide whether your question or the preamble is more important. You know, and, and so I have assisted members because um, when you, sometimes, and, and, and this is what I find, members ask questions about issues that they already know the answer. It's just a question of showing up the government. There's lots of that. But because of the fact that they know the answer, they don't ask the question that will bring out that particular answer. Sometimes I sense that. And once I told a member, you know, if you ask that question, all you're going to get is a yes or no. Why don't you ask the question that way? Oh, so you're an English teacher now. Well, you know, I mean, when you're trying to help people and that's the reaction you get, you just refrain from helping. And um, I don't know about your jurisdiction, but there are very many jurisdictions at which, in which members of parliament and English grammar are slightly at odds. And so when they ask the question and they don't get the answer that they wanted, oh, they're up in arms. But you have to be framing your question in such a way as to pull out the answer you want. And if you're not going to let some, the speaker or somebody else help you, then take your yes or your no. Time frames. Mm. Well, I mean, the standing orders are there for both government and opposition. And if the, I, I, the thing is, it all depends on the, 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 the how the, even the standing orders are worded. For example, um, the questions on the matter of questions, it clearly says that 
they must come in 14, anything for the older people must come in 14 days before. And that doesn't only include questions, but bills as well. And so what happens in our jurisdiction is that, and, and, and the, the, the AG and the AG's office know that I'm a stickler for the, the, the time frame. They send me a draft, whatever they have, they send it to me in, within the time. And then they tell me that the, the bill or whatever it is, is being um, printed in the government printery. And then we'll get it on time. So actually what they send me is like, you know, so at least we know what, what is coming. And I know exactly, in fact, they will let me know that there are four bills. There's, uh, so I'm well prepared. And so by the time we are ready to prepare our order paper, our order paper has to go out five clear days, four clear days before the meeting. And that order paper must have the bills. There has been on one occasion when there was a, a bill that was so voluminous that it didn't go out that day, allowing for the four clear days. And even government members, backbenchers, were saying that, you know, they had no time to look at this voluminous bill and how are they, prepared, how are they going to debate. And um, the leader of government business, the prime minister, asked that it be put for last because when we do have our meetings, our meetings go on for days. So, like, we have maybe four days of meetings so that be, it being put for last meant that the members would have time to look at it. My, my, my personal view is that if there are rules, they ought to be observed by both sides. And, and I don't, and, and there are occasions when the speaker is called upon to, um, you know, for example, when we were having our um, emergency meetings for me to inform the house of our, our president business, which is another story. Um, the, the standing orders permit the speaker to uh, abridge the, 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 the four days, but, but that is done very, very rarely. The, the, the four clear days, very, very, and the 12 days as well. The speaker does have leeway, but and, and, and to a member can stand and ask that the order paper um, be amended to accommodate, but usually um, it, it would be for things like um, congratulatory and um, obituary remarks, or perhaps a new member has come in to, to um, do the oath of, of or affirmation of allegiance or some such thing. Um, maybe to present a paper, but certainly not bills or anything like that. And, and you know, for the sake of um, orderliness, for the sake of transparency and, 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 and all these other lofty reasons, I think it is very important that the standing orders be adhered to um, very stringently. I mean, we do have um, certain areas they tell you when the standing orders um, are silent that we can look to maze. But um, the question arises as to when the standing orders are really silent. Sometimes members view it being silent when it is in fact not. And it's up to the speaker to point that out. So if, if I've made that clear, if there's anything else, I'll, I'll go on. Okay, so um, as I was saying, you know, the General authority of the speaker comes from standing order 86 in our, um, and I shall just read it quickly, it's, it's not very long. Subject to the provisions of paragraph one of standing order 87, which is reference to me, the speaker shall have the power to regulate and conduct the business of the house in all matters not provided for in this rule. So that's repeating standing order um, six for clarity. And it says the speaker shall be responsible for the management and general administration of the house 
and three, a decision by the speaker, whether related to these standing orders or to a matter for which these standing orders do not provide, shall not be challenged, save upon a substantive motion moved for that exclusive purpose. So very clearly, the, 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 the speaker under most jurisdictions has massive powers. And um, that does not make for popularity for a speaker to be popular with the recalcitrant members, be they on the government or opposition side. <laughs> no, um, one of the more ticklish duties assigned to the speaker in our jurisdiction is to assign seats to members when parliament reconvenes. Now I say it's ticklish because the members of the public who are viewing on television are watching to see which ministers sit in front and which ministers behind. And they interpret that as being, oh, so if I put the Minister of Agriculture in front and I put the Minister of Health behind, then they say, oh, so the speaker thinks agriculture is more important than health. You know, we get that. So, you know, you really have to be very, very, it's one of the most dodgy jobs that I have, I'm telling you. <laughs> Because all sorts of, of, of insinuations are implied when, when I am doing this. Now, the leader of government business in our jurisdiction, we don't have whips, is usually the prime minister, and the prime minister is also the minister of finance. So, um, who would usually give the budget address? And he usually moves the motions to suspend or adjourn the house, and in his absence, the house, from the house or um, as opposed to when he's just out of state, when there would be an acting prime minister, he advises the speaker as to who members would, do, would take his place. But um, standing order 13, is instructive in the sense that it's, you know, it provides for who can move a motion and when. You know, there's this motion, which is a very, um, what should I say, contentious one in certain jurisdictions, notably Trinidad, this business of definite matter of urgent public importance. I don't know if you have problems with that particular um, standing order, but it's where um, members, including members of the opposition, can move a motion for the adjournment of the House on the basis that there's definite matters of urgent public importance that need to be dealt with. Um, in my... Um, 15 years, 14 years, I've not had that problem, but I know they've had it. I don't know if in Jamaica you've had that problem. We, we had a recent example here where, where the speaker said it with the government and ruled it. They couldn't do it. And the, and the opposition was asking for an adjournment based an on adjournment that? For, to deal with an urgent matter. Well, um, I know that this matter has been tested in the courts. This what constitutes a matter of urgent public business. And you might want to look at that um, judgment to apprise yourself of when it is allowable and uh, based on the court decision. And, and you were saying? Well, mm -hmm. in Jamaica, our standing orders, we use pretty much the same way as the Cayman Islands um, standing order on the matter that, you know, but, um, about the actual adjournment, you know, how to go about it, getting the, Jeremy? Get, hearing me okay? Yes, I'm hearing you. Yes, getting, getting the speaker's approval prior. And this is one of the things every now and again you have a situation where the person springs upon their feet not having discussed it with the speaker at all beforehand. And at that point, you know, it, it gets shut down. But once they have discussed it with the speaker and he has approved it, it has not been a difficulty. But the standing orders provides for if the speaker does not approve it mm -hmm. and 
members get up on their feet, 16 members, because that's our quorum in the house, at least 16 persons, get up and you know, stand and you know, just in support of the member who wants to do the thing, mm. then they, they speak. It can be allowed or the speaker can stand it down for another day. So this, this is a provision that we have. But by and large, I think people know that they just need to get the approval. And usually, the speaker allows it once he has knowledge of it, even if it's not something that would necessarily fall into a definite matter of urgent public importance. We have two provisions on our standing order. One is you can move on a motion on the adjournment motion mm. moved by the Premier mm. to raise a matter that you regard either as your constituents' importance or national importance, which has to be approved by the Speaker and the Minister responsible has to be notified because the only two people allowed to speak on the motion is the both person moving the motion <coughs> and the Minister with responsibility who has to reply. We also have where you can ask for an adjournment motion in the middle of the proceedings in order to change to a new item of business. And that's what I was talking about. It was tried here recently and the speaker mm. sided with the government. No. Mm. Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. But then there's also this very niggling one. And, and in, during my tenure, we've had to deal with it once. And that is the question now we put. That is when members, I remember it was an amendment to a bill which had been passed by the then government, now in opposition, that um, pertaining to the um, World Heritage Site, just to change the wording. But the opposition was to the government, I guess, using it as an excuse to go and say all the wonderful things that they had done during their tenure, including getting this World Heritage Site. And it was about one o'clock in the morning, and um, a member just rose on his feet and, and, and just says that um, the question now be put, which means you say, basically, you fellas are not talking too much sense at this hour of the morning, so let's just close off this thing. Of course, the speaker now has to deal with whether the question now we put is being, is, is fairly, if, did every member get a chance to say what he had to say? To me, that was the over, that was early days in, in my being speaker. But m the overriding consideration for me was that uh, most of the opposition members had spoken, number one, and they were all repeating each other. And then the other thing was that um, there was, to my mind, nothing to be lost by closing off the debate at that time because um, most of the opposition members had spoken, as I said, and um, the government members were not really speaking because at that late hour, I guess, members were getting testy. And so I said, well, okay, um, I would allow it. But two members of the opposition thought that I should not have allowed it. But the, the others seem to have agreed. But it, it can be a very ticklish uh, matter to, you know, to decide to close off the beat. I certainly um, wouldn't do it for fact, budget. But you see, at budget time, there's a cat and mouse game that is being played and, and really one year, the, the uh, one year for budget, what happens is that government members are allowed to, the ministers are allowed to speak for an hour and members um, for half an hour. And very few of the government members had spoken and the opposition members were not standing up to speak when I say, any member left to speak, nobody's standing. I say, are you ready to wind up? They still remain seated. So the, when the Prime Minister bobbed up, I thought he was just going to, you know, prompt them to stand up and, 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 and make their contribution. Instead, he just wound up and that was it. And the opposition members were caught napping. And even while he was speaking, they still didn't say, well, okay, I want to speak. They just left it at that. 
and it was kind of embarrassing that, you know, I think only one opposition member has, had spoken at that time. And so the, even government members hadn't spoken. So that was a very short budget debate that year. But it, it is not the responsibility of the speaker to encourage members to speak. The responsibility of the speaker to recognize a person who tries to catch the speaker's attention to speak. Yes. We have the same situation here where the speaker will call, does any member wish to speak? Does any member wish to speak four, five, six times? And nobody gets up. No, in my position, no speaker should ever have, do that. If nobody gets up and wants to speak, she has an obligation to call on the person moving the bill to respond, to reply. Yes, yeah, but you do this because, you know, you, 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 you let members know. Sometimes, uh, one of the other things is that in our jurisdiction, members just drift outside. Sometimes there has been at least two occasions on which members outside, when I count, the quorum is 12, we don't have quorum, uh, members there, and I just said I'm going to suspend the house on my own motion and walk out because members have been walking out. And similarly, um, it could be that members are outside and among themselves they decide who's going to speak first, but they don't tell me. Members of the government do the same thing. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to give you all a chance. Any member wants to speak and I'm not, the, the standing orders do not bar me from doing this, nor do, does the standing order, do the standing orders recommend that I do this. But I think in the interest of the public that needs to hear as many members as possible on an important issue like the budget, you know, have their say, budgets and supplementary estimates. So it isn't that I feel that I'm obliged to do it, but I'm encouraging the opposition to acknowledge their role, step up to the plate and, and, and say what they, 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 they need to say for the betterment of the parliament and, 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 and getting the public to know. Sometimes um, too much power can be a dangerous thing. Let's put it that way. Okay, now, so... <clears throat> No, um, I was saying in, in, a, in small parliaments such as ours, and it's a unique feature of being a unicameral legislature where elected members and senators sit together, the current configuration of our house, though not as uniquely startling as Grenada, we all know Grenada is, everybody is the government. Who is, who is not a minister is a backbencher, amen. But we, ours is not a, as, as drastic, but we, we do have a situation where government has 18 elected members, five senators, and so therefore that makes them have a total of 23, and then of course the AG 24, although he's supposed to be impartial, nonetheless, he, he does make his contribution and so. So out of the 18 members, five are backbenchers and one is the deputy speaker because under our, in, in our jurisdiction, the deputy speaker must be an elected member. You can take your speaker from outside, but the deputy must be elected. So that way we have five backbenchers and most of them, of course, would be senators. So now, um, in that scenario, um, the all rights and privileges accorded to members are also conferred on the um, AG and the member who is the deputy speaker, when not actually sitting in the chair, has all the rights and privileges as an ordinary member. So it is only when the, speak, the deputy speaker is in the chair that he or she is removed from that situation. And so the other 12 members now are either ministers or parliamentary secretaries. Now, as I said before, at budget time, the standing orders are uh, su suspended to allow ministers to speak for one hour and other members for half an hour. Now, the leader of the opposition is supposed to be the one who conducts business of the opposition. He's supposed to, well, in what act similarly like, I guess, a whip, since we don't have those. 
and he's also mandated to reply to the budget address. And he's given the same, he's allocated the same time as the length of the budget speech. <clears throat> I have heard it said that members of the opposition have a different role to play in parliament from that of government members. I really would be interested in finding out what you members feel about this. If I were asked that question, however, I would have to answer yes and no. An often quoted maxim which emphasizes the difference in rules is that the opposition has its say, but the government has its way. And so if it is accepted that the major role of members of parliament is to assist in the passage of laws, amending laws, and having oversight of decisions of the executive, it would seem that the opposition's role is minimal in, 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 in that respect. But parliament takes on many other fun functions. And I think where which allows for a vibrant and vigilant opposition to make its mark. For example, the right of members to ask questions of ministers is one way that opposition members can bring forward information to the public. And in Dominica, although it is very rare, backbenchers can also ask questions. Um, what I find is that backbenchers are generally um, I don't want to use the word used, but um, uh, um, help, helped along by the, the government members to ask questions of the, the opposition when they were in government. For example, I rem recall that some years ago, the opposition asked a question about the, the amount of money that the government minister the Prime Minister had spent in traveling over a particular period. The question was answered. But then in the next meeting, the quest, a backbencher asked the question, how much money did the then Prime Minister spend on traveling over that period of time? And it was almost three times that of the prime, present Prime Minister. So they do that to sort of show, show up. I don't know if this is done in your jurisdiction, but. So there, they, but it's, it's, there's nothing to, yes, they are utilized, yes, you can see it like that. And so that, that happens as well. And, um, but as I say, the opposition can ask very probing questions and do so within the rules. They just have to be savvy enough to do so. And um, allow the speaker to help them when the speaker is willing to do so. Um, <clears throat> As I mentioned yesterday, our parliament is not very strong on committees, it's more so the um, public accounts committee. But um, we do at the beginning of each um, parliament, there is a privileges committee set up and broadcast committee. And you will, um, in our jurisdiction, this is where you find that um, backbenchers, whether they are members of parliament and senators on the government side, and the members of the opposition would be utilized to be on those committees. And even when the House is, is, is in committee, and when the House is in committee, that's close to the radio and television, um, the backbenchers, of course, can be made to serve in those particular capacities. Now, generally, any member may move for leave to introduce a bill and take the bill through its stages once it is not what is known as a money bill. Um, it has to be a, a government minister do that with this, um, with, with the assent of the president that is required in our jurisdiction. 
I have to say this, and I don't know if it's very applicable here, but it certainly is in my jurisdiction and certain other jurisdictions that uh, I'm, I'm familiar with what goes on in their parliament. I think the biggest problem speakers encountered is the fact that members do not know the rules of the house. They do not take time to learn the standing orders. And they shoot from, from the hip as it were. Um, I think it behoves members to, to take the standing orders seriously. It's not a matter of um, facilitating the speaker or helping the speaker if members know the rules. It's a member, it's a matter that if the standing orders are um, adhered to, it makes for a, a, a smoother running of the house and a lot more can be done in a shorter space of time. And we all know that time is always of the essence. And so this is why I think that this post-election seminar, uh, these post-election seminars generally are useful, not only to new members to learn, but also members of long standing would be able to refresh their knowledge because like everything else, as we grow older, we forget. And with the passage of time, members may need to, you know, just refresh their memories as to what the standing orders would be. Now, before I, I conclude, I just want to say that it would be remiss of me if I did not touch on the specific role of women members of parliament. When they are in government as ministers, backbenchers, senators in government, women members of parliament usually take on the nurturing rules in the parliament. Um, it, is, it used to be that women were given soft ministries, Ministry of Social Services and, and all of these. But now that um, more and more women are becoming leaders in their own right, we have several women prime ministers in the region now, not necessarily in the Commonwealth. And then um, we see ministers women ministers being given hard ministries such as finance, foreign affairs, and all of that. It means that there's a general recognition that uh, um, women have a role to play. And uh, I would have to say that men are more amenable now than they were previously to um, having women play these roles. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about this because I, um, I think we need a, 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 it's such a wide topic, I, I need, need to deal with it there in, on that basis rather than now because I, I, I don't want to, to, to cloud the issue too much but I would take questions and suggestions you know, about the various rules of the various members. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The floor is now open for questions or comments. I'm, I'm referring to a publication of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association in association with the Commonwealth Secretariat. They did a workshop in London in 1998 on the role of the opposition. And I just want to just highlight some of the things that, you know, speaks about in the role of the opposition. Asking, you know, what is, the, what is the opposition anyway? And, you know, what they're talking about is constructive opposition. And I remember a, a former <coughs> prime minister, in now in opposition, then in opposition, not now, then in opposition, he said the role of opposition is to oppose, oppose, and oppose. And that is, that it came across in a very negative way you know, that's not constructive opposition. And so, you know, um, the, you know there, there was this um, hue and cry, you know, it's really not responsible. So it's just how do you hold the executive to account? And in Parliament, the, the ways we talked about yesterday, <coughs> committees, questions, motions, <coughs> private members' bills, those are the ways in which you you hold the executive to account. And, and Madam Speaker just spoke about questions. You know, it's a way in which you ask the question. You make sure you ask the question so that it really does elicit the information that you, you really want and not just yes or no, which the minister is absolutely entitled to do. Um, 
the, the, the one session dealt with the opposition as the alternative government. And what this was saying that it was, you know, um, to make sure that the parliament was used effectively to promote the opposition as a team to continue to review its overall approach and ensure that it interacted effectively with independent institutions to formulate new policies. So that, that, that opposition did have a responsibility to try to use the parliament effectively. I remember, and then one of the things is that it says now, respect by government for parliament, access for the opposition to the media, to funds and to sources of information, including the civil service, and those were some of the things that were seen as constraints, that the, go the government was not sufficiently facilitative to opposition members. And this needs to be done, is collaboration. I remember one member coming to me at the, at the table and saying, you know, I noticed that when the government members are speaking, they get the TV cameras on them. And when opposition members are speaking, they don't have. And I had to make a point of telling the public broadcasting people to make sure that they're balanced in the way they, they um, show who is speaking at any given point in time. I mean, you know, it might seem to some as petty, but when you are making your speech, you think you ought to get the same amount of mileage as the next man, regardless of what side of the aisle he sits on. So I had to make the representation. Um, the legislative function, and this is important, collaboration is important. Behind the scenes contact is one of the things it talks about. Behind the scenes contact with government and discussion in committee. Now the behind the scenes contact, I know that we have had some bills that have been problematic and the, you know, it, even at the time some of the government members were not too happy with it. So what they did, they had some, you know, after hours meetings on, you know, just a select group coming together to, to discuss the points that were sticking points to see how far they could arrive at consensus. And that is important. You know, don't, don't um, feel that we're government, we don't need to share this information, or we are opposition, we don't want to talk to you. You, it, you know, these kinds of things help for collaboration. So ultimately, you know, it's, it's, it's more effective than when you go on the floor to talk about it and then the bill doesn't get passed because, or gets passed with everybody not being happy. So, and then another point was the importance of the impartiality of the, on the part of the speaker. The presiding officer must be impartial, can't be, you know, to, to make sure that the work gets done. Independent legal advice we talked about when I mentioned about our legislative council yesterday. And then now the question of consens consensus and the national interest. You know, sometimes as opposition, we might want to expose things that's happening, you know, that the government is not talking about. But sometimes the national, one, one that comes readily to mind, you know, in respect of national interest, there might be a health issue, but you don't want to cause panic among the, 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 in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the public domain. You know, it's being addressed, it's being contained, whatever the issue is, is it thing, but just, you know, you don't, you, you, you know, you don't want to answer a question in Parliament about that, because all it's gonna do is cre create undue panic. So sometimes, you know, that, that it might be a very good sound question to be asked. But the, the national interest should be everybody's concern, not just the government's concern. And um, there was just one last thing, recognition of responsibilities. And this was talking about, you know, just an example, um, how we treat the opposition. And it was saying that some, some countries assign a formal place for the leader of the opposition and our up lead of the opposition in our constitution is recognized as a, a constitutional post. Mm -hmm. So I recall that um, back in, in like 2006, we had, or prior to that in fact, you know, whenever we had visiting dignitaries, 
we had to, for the leader of the opposition or a member of the opposition to meet, we had to meet them in their private office or, or meet them, you know, set up a, a hotel suite for them to meet these persons. And, you know, something was a little off about that because they didn't really have a formal office. A small office is assigned to the leader of the opposition in the parliament building, but that's just when they are at parliament. But, you know, like how oh, the office of the prime minister, she can receive, receive dignitaries and so, there was no place like that for the leader of the opposition. And when um, Prime Minister Golden came in, he said that this is one of the, you know, he spoke about it before, that this was something that was needed. And as that was one of his first priorities, to identify a, a government-owned building and had it nicely fixed up as the, for the office of the leader of the opposition. And, you know, you have with staffing and all of that. And it may, has made a tremendous difference to, to things. You know, it really is according that courtesy of that. And so having financial support for the officer, <coughs> leader's office, having the members having the same access. So if it is um, training opportunities or, you know, any, any, anything like that, a balanced um, delegation you know, of, you know, and, and, and getting security protection, things like that. Those are the kinds of things that you accord to persons who are like leader of the opposition. You know, he gets similar treatment and, and it, 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 it makes for harmony in the long run. So, my two cents worth on that. So. Can, I, can I just add some things to what I said? Um, First of all, um, in keeping with what um, Heather has just said, the, the idea of shadow ministers among opposition is a very good one. I think it gives the opposition structure and it makes a more pronounced raison d'etre, a reason for being there. As she pointed out, you're a government in waiting. And so if you have that structure going for you, there's more impetus to, you know, do things and focus. Um, on the, I, I, I neglected to say when, I was, when it was mentioned by the, the member over there that um, the, on the issue of ministers not answering questions, um, I'm pleased to say that Dominica has a very good track record of questions being answered. But I know in Trinidad the that is where the most dismal um, track record existed. In, in, and I think me, the, the ministers were actually taken to court to answer questions. I'm sorry, um, the speaker is not there to um, enlighten us further on that. And as it relates to um, the, what Heather just said about former Prime Minister Goulding, it brings to mind a saying we have in our country. Um, I'll say it in Creole and then I'll translate. Sawat kadian fitai kai se pasai kadiate. Translated, it means what the rat says in the eaves of the house is not what he says on the ground. And I don't think there's any other um, discipline, profession, or whatsoever that you can think of where that is not more applicable than politicians. When they're in opposition, they see everything wrong. Suddenly we get into parliament, everything is right. And so it, 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 more, more power to, to former Prime Minister Goulding for having seen something that was amiss while in opposition and carrying it through to government. This is a rarity. I know Kenny Anthony had did a few things like that, things that he said in opposition when he got back into government, he, he rectified them. We need to see more of that happening with our, our Caribbean governments and, you know, when they, when they switch to opposition and so on. And then one other thing I, I, I want to say is that um, seeing that Dominica is, is guilty of this, I'm, 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 re I'm reluctantly bringing forward the fact that, like other Caribbean countries, Cayman Islands is way behind with its Millennium Development Goals as far as women in Parliament is concerned. And um, I, I rue the fact that I am there advocating for more women in Parliament and my country, well, we'll see what happens in the next elections because heaven knows. I'm so pleased that even not in Parliament, but certainly in village councils and in the city council, two women 
said that they um, were motivated to put themselves forward because of me. So, a glimmer of hope, but still, I, I want, you know, a, a, a beam of hope. <laughs> and so, I'm hoping that next time, if I'm invited to post lecture seminars, I'll say, wow, look at the women. And then I can give a good discourse about what women's rules ought to be. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker White Knight. Um, just to give you a bit of glimmer of hope, uh, this year in our elections, this, this was the year that we had the most number of women actually putting themselves forward as candidates. We had about nine in total across the, the countries, um, even though only two of us were successful in getting elected. I think that actually was very a very positive move on the part of um, women's interests and also demonstrating that we we deserve a place at the table. So I'm hoping that you know four years from now we'll see the same number of candidates, if not more, and also hopefully uh, more successful persons in the house as well. But I just wanted to share that share that glimmer of hope with you and to say thank you very much for continuing in your advocacy role as well as, well as your uh, very important role in what you're doing in the region and in Dominica in particular. Thank you. Okay, I just like in my, using my regional secretary hat, I would just like to promote um, a regional meeting of, of um, women parliamentarians from this region um, to be held in the Bahamas next month, the 11th and 12th of December are the dates. Um, Further information is supposed to be coming out, but we, we just want you to bear those dates in mind. Mm -hmm. um, this was a commitment that was made at the annual regional conference in mm -hmm. July, mm -hmm. at the end of July, that there would be this follow-up meeting to try and do a, 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 you know, a, a little plan of how to move the, the region's women forward together in a more united way, because what Structured. was happening, it was just happening you know, from one year to the next. You mm -hmm. meet and you meet next year, but nothing happens in between. So this. This is something that was agreed and it's going to be followed through on 11th of, and 12th of, of December. Um, just on the matter of questions, you know, it, it's the, the question of sanctions when a minister does not answer questions. Our standing orders actually has a provision called deferral of question. So when you defer, you, a minister seeking to defer has to, is supposed to give it in writing to the clerk, so true to the speaker to explain what the reason for the, the, the deferral, re request for deferral, and the House may extend the time for answering by a period of not more than 14 days. <laughs> so, you know, you come now to the, the, um, the, the 14 days where the answer has not been, in, been supplied, then, the, you know, there is a recommendation to be made to the Committee on Privileges. Now, in all my time there, I know that there has been delay in responding to, to questions and no minister has ever been sanctioned. Sometimes they just say, okay, it's going to stay there and fall off the other people, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm not answering that question. And occasionally, like a question might go through the cracks where the speaker approves something, but when you look at the, you know, look again at the question, and this is one of the things I have asked and the speaker supports, to have the questions sent in good time so that they can be adequately reviewed. So you don't have those kinds of questions that are, should not be there in the first place, but because you know, you're hastily doing, you overlook something. So we, and especially now for the Senate, we have a, a, our president of the Senate is blind. And so we have to, I, I insist that we get the things by Wednesday so that I can review them and send them to him so that he can get them before Friday morning. So this is something that we ask, we give them a cut off time and except in you know, exceptional circumstances, we, we adhere to the cut off time for both the House and the Senate just to get the things in on time so that we can have adequate review time. So that is something that could be considered as well. To, to, uh, in addition to being diligent about following the standing orders, what they say about the, the, the asking of the questions, the time in which they're submitted, make it be timely so that there's adequate review time for the speaker to ensure that the question can be you know, brought forward. Thank you. All right, members, if there are no more questions, that brings us to the end of session six. We're going to have a 15-minute break.
So if we can come back at 10 past 11. See you in a bit. Thank you.